Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session on pursuing a metaverse based on democratic values. Really pleased to have those of you in the room and online joining us today. Um, those of you that are in the room and want to take a seat at the table, we invite you to join us. Uh, feel free. Um, this session has been organized by OECD's Global Forum on Technology and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan. So I would like to th start out by thanking uh, very kindly our colleagues from Japan for making the session possible and their role hosting uh, the IGF this year. We're extremely excited to be a part of that. The Global Forum on Technology, or GF Tech as we often refer to it, provides a venue for regular in-depth dialogue to foresee and get ahead of long-term opportunities and risks that are presented by technology. It will facilitate inclusive, in-depth, and multi-stakeholder values-based discussions on specific policy topics among OECD members and stakeholders, responding to gaps in existing fora. The discussions at the GF Tech will feed into and advance future work of relevant OECD committees or other fora. Currently, GF Tech is focused on three technologies, immersive technologies, quantum technologies, and synthetic biology. The GF Tech will look at these technologies through the lens of three cross-cutting themes, sustainable development and resilient societies, responsible values-based and rights-oriented technologies, bridging digital and technological divides. We're going, to hear a we're going to have a chance to hear more about all of that and how this will be pursued during this exchange, but this is a little context for you on why the government of Japan and the OECD GF Tech team have joined forces to bring all of these diverse voices together and explore this path towards the metaverse based on democratic values. I have now the pleasure, the great pleasure of introducing you to our keynote speaker, Vice Governor Akimasa Yamashita, of Kyo Vice Governor of Kyoto. Um, please note that Mr. Yamashita will intervene in Japanese, but his intervention is going to be subtitled here. And for those of you that are in the room, if you don't already have headsets, please grab one. You'll be able to follow the discussion uh, this way. ファイスガブナー。え、ご紹介いただきましてまして、ありがとうございます。えっと、昭和昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、昭和、
倫理観でやるべきではないかというふうに思いました、えー、私は1995年ぐらいからインターネットやってますけどもまあいいところも悪いところも全部見てきてですね、えー、必ずメタ上でもいろんなことが起こるだろうというふうに思いましたでいいメタ社会を作るためにはまあ参加していただく方に、えー、なんかこうこれは守っていきましょうというような倫理的なあの宣言を作りたいなと思いまして、えー、東京の疾風協議会さんと半年ぐらい議論をさせていただいて次のスライドに出ておりますけれども10個の宣言をしていただきたいというようなことを思いました。えー、当然あの自由ででオープンですしえーまあ、いろんな方が参加できる社会ですしモラルが問われますし法節性も大事ですししかもなおかつ持続性の高いメタの社会を作りたいということでございます。えー、ここではですねできるだけ各会社さんの柔道を高めながらも節度を持ったビジネス展開をしましょうということで、えーまあ、表示も共通の表示を作って我々の方からこの宣言に賛同していただいた企業さんあるいは個人の方研究者の方にこの10箇条を守っていただくというマークをつけさせていただいてそのマークを持っておられる企業さんはこの10箇条の倫理観に基づいてメタの社会でいろんなことをしましょうということを宣言をしていただくというようなことをやりました。えー、この10箇条を読んでいただくと非常にあの中身の濃い10箇条になっているというふうに思っておりますので、まあ、このスライドではなかなか見えないかも分かりませんけれどあの我々としては、えー、多分ワールドワイドでも使っていただける、えー、トラストステートメントになっているというふうに思いますので、えー、これを土台に。あのいいメタの社会を作っていきたいなというふうに思っておりますまずあの最初はこれぐらいで終わらせていただきますありがとうございましたありがとうございました。Um, we are also very pleased to be in your fair city, so we thank you also for your kind hospitality this week. I'm now going to turn to our panel discussion.、Um, before I jump into that, we're talking,、uh, we're using a term metaverse.、Um, just to level set what we're talking about, this is the term that was coined by fiction writer Neil Stephenson. Um, and it's used to describe this virtual environment where immersive technologies are used. So, that the physical and digital worlds might converge, so that people might interact with each other and with the digital content at the same time. We're going to hear a lot more elaborated on that, but this does seem to be a very,、uh, and, and it seems to be a very exciting、uh, area that's attracting quite a significant amount of attention, but also funding. There are venture capitalists、uh, investing heavily in startups. We've seen Uh, funding rise from $2 billion US dollars in 2016 in venture capital funding to over $12 billion five, five years later. Earlier this year, KPMG's North America survey reported that the ma vast majority of investors, about 90%, believe that the metaverse is the next phase of the internet, and they imagine a future in which it's utilized for work, meetings, trainings, and learning experiences. 75% of those investors responded that they plan to maintain or increase their metaverse investments over the next five years. So it's not surprising that there's a lot to talk about. Earlier this year at the Global Forum on Technology, we had an inaugural event in Paris in June. There was a deep dive discussion on immersive technologies where we heard from a panel of speakers. Spanning perspectives from Africa, South Asia, Latin America, the United States, and the European Union. 
They noted that technologies such as virtual, augmented, or mixed reality have this potential to transform industries. They mentioned its capacity to foster empathy, understanding about issues like climate change, to create also deep human connections. At the same time, they described use cases in healthcare, retail, manufacturing, and entertainment. They also cited education as holding particular promise for those in resource-constrained environments. It was raised that these technologies also magnify pre-existing concerns, such as privacy, security, ethics, and disinformation. During the discussion, speakers called for balanced regulatory frameworks to maximize benefits and mitigate risks to incentivize safe, responsible, and trustworthy innovation. Sustainability and environmental uh, implications and inclusion were also identified as critical for immersive technologies must be accessible to all to avoid widening divides. Persisting technical challenges such as mo motion sickness and latency were identified as remaining uh, issues for technologists, but speakers also agreed that the biggest challenges in this area will fall to policymakers. So today, we have this opportunity to convene with you in Tokyo and those of you online to take this discussion further and explore how we can pursue a metaverse we want for our societies based on democratic values. To help us do that, I'm incredibly pleased to introduce your speakers. Uh, to my right here, we have Audrey Plonk, the head of digital economy policy of it, division at the OECD. We have to my uh, left, Mr. Shokura Kozuka, professor of law at Gakushun University and chair of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications Metaverse Task Force. We also have Mr. Pierce O'Donohue, Director of the Directorate General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology, DG Connect, at the European Commission. Uh, we have Ms. Camilla Leite Contri, who's a specialist at the Brazilian Consumer Protection Institute. Welcome. And we have Mr. Chate, Chate uh, Pecure. Curer, Human Rights Policy Manager for the Africa, Middle East, and Tur uh, Turkey region. Uh, stepping in for your colleague, thank you so much. We also online, we have Mr. Neil Trevitt, Chairman of the Metaverse Standards Forum and Vice President Developer Ecosystems at NVIDIA, who is uh, hopefully there on the Zoom platform with you. Thank you, Neil. Um, before turning it over to our speakers, I just want to let you know that we do have a question and answer period planned in this session. So if you have questions, feel free to um, note them and hold on to them. For those of you in the room, we'll open the floor and the microphones for panel, uh, for questions after the panel. And for those of you online, you'll be joined by my colleague, uh, Maria Castano, who is serving as your online moderator and who will help facilitate bringing you into this room. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to you, Professor. As chair of the MIC Task Force on the Metaverse, could you please share with us some of the key issues that have emerged and the impetus for seeking cooperation and standards for the Metaverse? Yes, thank you, Aidy. And with pleasure, I will talk about and the activities of the study group that uh, uh, or the task force uh, in Japan, we, we tend to use the word ta study group. Yeah, thank you very much. And I now uh, the, the, my slide is shared on, online. Uh, well, and, uh, the study group was established uh, in August of last year, and we met almost every month and published a report and, uh, earlier this year. And uh, uh, we uh, tried to uh, uh, find, uh, 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 find the, the, what is really happening with regard to metaverse. And uh, we identified that uh, several issues uh, uh, that focus more on the activities within metaverse. Uh, for example, the, the issues uh, concerning avatars. And uh, uh, Elizabeth now mentioned the, 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 the disinformation issue and with regard to avatars and as players in the metaverse, uh, so how we, we can address the fake avatars. Uh, this is a, a, a one of the issues. A, 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 
it, to be discussed under this item. And also very important is the interoperability uh, among platforms. There may be several platforms uh, 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 doing, uh, providing services commercially uh, in parallel. And so and, uh, uh, from the user side, uh, how to uh, jump from one world or one platform to another platform is very important. And uh, not least to ensure their freedom and uh, ensure their right uh, in the virtual world. And a, a, another, a, there are also more kind of technical issues and a, a when a constructing a, the, the virtual world in the metaverse. And for example, how to clear the rights, uh, intellectual property rights or rights to pri uh, publicity, and uh, when uh, copying or uh, kind of casting the actual uh, 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 buildings or things into the, the metaverse. And also an a, a issues related to data acquisition. Of course, they, that is a very important. I, I mean, data a acquisition of personal data of the users and a, through uh, the, uh, that person's activities in the metaverse. There are other issues and a, a that concern the relationship between the, the metaverse and the real world. And a, one of them is the, the user interface and user experience, including the, the, the adverse effects and a, a, that a, a spending long, term, a long time uh, in the metaverse could have on the health of the user. And uh, finally, but not least important, and a, a we need to watch closely how the technology develops and how the society responds to these developments of the metaverse. And based on these findings, and a, a, the, the study group and a, a thought that and a, a, there are a, a few approaches to be followed or to be pursued. Uh, one of them is, to, a, 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 is that it is very important to have kind of a common understanding about how to and a, a address these metaverse issues. And this a common understanding a better to be shared globally and a, a because in the metaverse, we tend to have less borders or national borders and a, based on the sovereign a, states in, in the real world. And so, and it's very important. And also with regard to the relationship between the service providers and the users, a, we need to have some guidelines to show and a, so that the service providers could comply with, with them and ha, a, provide a, a safe and a kind of consumer-oriented services. And a, the metaverse could be a more kind of the, 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 the safe place a, for play, users to and, a, enter. And finally, the, with regard to the interoperability, uh, we need to facilitate the, 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 the industry's uh, initiatives. And uh, we uh, identified already that there are so, uh, a few initiatives, and so we need to kind of back them up, uh, including standardization. So these are the, the findings and our thoughts at the, at the, the, the study group uh, set up by the Ministry of Interna Internal Affairs and Communications. And I think uh, it's very useful to share among the, the, the participants from the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We'll come back to you for maybe a few more details. Um, Audrey, I wonder if you could please share with us some of the insights that have come from OECD's experiences facilitating global cooperation on policy and support to support values-based technology development and to think about that cooperation and offer perspe a perspective on what we can draw um, from those experiences. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for making the time to join the session. Um, so. As the OECD, we have a, a lot of history in developing multilateral instruments for, for cooperation. And in the area of technology, I think we have also quite a long history of developing instruments that are values-based and that have been uh, fairly influential in terms of how policy and legislation develops over time. Um, a couple examples that that just come to mind. Um, the first is the OECD privacy guidelines, and I know we have colleagues here from business at OECD that are um, undertaking a project that looks at the metaverse through the lens of the, the OECD privacy guidelines, so um, so it's, it's maybe something to look at. But th those really are um, the foundation of, of m every major privacy 
piece of legislation uh, on the planet, and, and most many, many, many countries have them now that map directly back to the OECD privacy guidelines. They are um, a baseline in a lot of ways, but they're an important starting point to harmonize um, some aspects of, of, of privacy, for example. And, uh, and so I think there are other, we have, we have other instruments, the AI principles, which you're probably all familiar with, are another example of a more recent instrument. The privacy guidelines date back to 1980, so they've been around for a long time and have been relatively stable. They've been revised a couple of times, um, but, the, but they've been a very stable, um, again, baseline to embed privacy protections into data protection and privacy legislation. As AI has developed the AI principles of 2019, um, when they were being developed starting in 2017, 2018, they really set out to look at the technology through a human rights and values lens. And so many of the, 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 the topics of, uh, that you would think of as, as values, democratic values, are um, embedded therein. And then, and then the work around a specific technology is to, to do uh, research and analysis around what it, what it means to apply that particular value in the context that we're looking at, so in AI or in immersive technologies. Um, because I think at a, at a, at a relatively high level, um, uh, we understand human rights and, and to some degree their application, but when we start introducing new environments, immersive technologies, we introduce new technological trends, it's harder to understand necessarily how they apply. And so a lot of the work that goes into developing at least from the OECD's perspective, values-based or democratic values-based, human rights-based approaches to governing technology is about taking things that we know to be values and applying them in those contexts. And so um, the AI principles certainly do that. We have um, uh, a series of instruments around uh, cybersecurity that look at things um, a slightly from a more technical level, but in all those instruments you'll see um, elements of democratic and, and human rights values embedded into those uh, in, into those instruments, and so I think um, there's lots of different uh, you know there, there's a spectrum of of policy making um, that goes from sort of technical standards all the way up to hard law, and and we at the OECD at least sit somewhere in the middle where we tend to do um, uh, we do policy standards that are largely um, voluntary in the sense that they're they're not necessarily enforceable um, by a court of law, but they are uh, a commitment at a political and at, at a technical level to follow. And so we can usually make progress uh, slightly faster than some hard laws, and they can be the basis for um, future policy and legislation. And we've done that in, in a lot of different areas, and I think as technology uh, advances, uh, I suspect there will be demand uh, to, to do that in more areas. I think some of the fundamental aspects of how we do it uh, are, are um, based in part of why we're all here at the IGF, uh, multi-stakeholderism, engagement with a wide community of, of people and expertise across the business community and academia and civil society and the technical world in order to create um, uh, you know, policy standards that are um, that can be implemented on some level, and so one of the big challenges with principles, um, guiding principles or, or, or high-level principles, is just ha how to take them from principle to practice. And so that's an important aspect of developing policy uh, guidance: is to think about um, how to take again a, a high-level democratic value and embed it into something that's actionable by. Um, by either uh, by any actor, but um, certainly in the technology space, we think a lot about how it's implementable um, and the design and development and the deployment and diffusion of, of different technologies. And so I think the, the process by which we work makes it um, uh, has been, you know, at least demonstrably successful in various domains and technology in terms of the ability to um, to, to, to create the kinds of environments where people can come together and agree on, uh, at whatever level they can agree on how to, how to interpret uh, these kind of rights um, and values in the context of new and emerging technologies. And I was very much struck by the, the, the Kyoto City's 10, uh, 10 values, which I think were, uh, which I would actually like to get that slide because I think there's some, some key elements there that, um, 
I won't say they're they're missing, but I you know don't often see some things characterized, um, certain values characterized the way that Japan has characterized them in this context. And so I think it's very interesting for us to think about. The last thing I'll say just about the immersive space, because we have a lot of different work at the OECD in this global forum and otherwise thinking about immersive environments and the implications. And um, you know, we have in our in our forthcoming digital economy outlook, which will will come out next year, uh, one of the pieces that looks at, at mental health in the digital age looks at immersive, and it's it's very it's an interesting look into how um, things that we may find completely acceptable in the physical world seem very different to people in an immersive environment, and so it does require at least it seems to us require a different look at that environment um, um, because the the context has changed and 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 so there while we might all believe in privacy or we might all believe even self-determination or whatever, it might it like, might look very different um, in in that environment. So, and they're different lens. So we look at it through a lens of, of mental health. We also look for the, from the through a lens of the technology itself. What's happening with the technology? How's it being built? Who's building it? How accessible is it to all the things that Elizabeth talked about at the beginning? Um, and then through the lens of different policy domains with which we have expertise, like privacy and security and safety. Um, and I think all of those are really important to bring together if we're going to think about how to govern this kind of space in the future to, to reap its benefits, which we, we've touched on a little bit, but I think there's some pretty compelling and exciting use cases, which we heard about at our inaugural event back in June um, around the immersive space. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, we're going to turn to Pierce now. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the EU's perspective on metaverse development, um, perhaps sharing some of the insights. I know you've had this consultation uh, work going on, and so, so if you could just share a few reflections on that with us. Thanks, Pierce. Thank you, indeed. Good afternoon, and happy to do so, because it was just in July that the European Commission issued a policy communication where we outlined our uh, our vision and strategy for virtual worlds and for the transition to web 4.0, which we feel that this will be part of. And before we wrote anything down to feed that communication, uh, the Commission worked with stakeholders in Europe, among others industry and academia, as well as with the specific industry, the European VR and AOR coalition, to better understand the opportunities, but also the challenges that we were facing in Europe with regard to virtual worlds. We also engage with citizens, in particular in relation to the societal implications and challenges that are stemming from the virtual worlds as we understand it now. And we had a, a citizens panel on virtual worlds, which led to 23 recommendations, and those fed into the communication and will help steering our work. So an, an example of including uh, the multi-stakeholder community at an early stage in what is a very important policy development in this area. And just as we see from the discussions today in the EU, there's a, there's a clear wish to contribute to um, steering this revolution, because that is what we think it is, towards the use of values such as the respect of human rights, privacy, security, openness, accessibility. And those values underpin the overall EU approach to digital transformation, as you might recognize, and it's enshrined in the European Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles. And they're part also of our international commitment, as set out in the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, which we actually had another detailed workshop on here, a forum this morning. So why is it urgent to define a strategy? Well, it's because most of the technologies underpinning this new development or this wave of innovation um, uh, have been around for decades, but the combined effect of them with some new technologies reaching maturity today make it a sudden shift. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot that we have to understand. So we need to understand how can we set the course for virtual worlds that aren't dominated uh, only by a few big players, but also which do respect uh, human rights and principles and which are in that term human centric. So we're aiming at uh, the virtual worlds and the web 4.0 to be powered by obviously open and highly distributed technologies and standards, which is the question that enable interoperability, 
um, and freedom of choice f at the same time for users, but also which incorporate other key policy issues such as sustainability, which also must now be at the core of technological developments. So that interoperability, openness, security, as well as key issues like identity, rights, transaction management, they're all at the top of our agenda uh, for the virtual worlds and they call for global standards to, de to be developed and agreed. And so, just as been said already, standardization will be, in key, will be key to enabling interoperability between different parts, different platforms, different networks, and will allow, from the user's perspective, the seamless use of identities, avatars, data, virtual assets, uh, and, of course, doing so in a secure environment and bringing with it the associated rights for the user across platforms and networks. And since we are looking at virtual worlds, um, we want to look at open virtual worlds and therefore open standards, coupled with the support for open source innovation, uh, such as in relation to the use of distributed ledger technology and other technologies needed for the authenticity, management and security of virtual objects and identities. Without imposing one of those that I've just referred to, but it must be possible that there are discussions with regard to what is the most appropriate in view of those societal considerations that I referred to just a moment ago. Now, just to conclude, we're aware of several international uh, initiatives in this respect, and at the same time, I think we're all aware that we are facing a governance gap with regard to the metaverse, with regard to virtual worlds. Now, I understand that we're going to come to that later and we're having a, a session specifically on this ourselves we're organizing on Wednesday afternoon here in Kyoto. But the governance issue is also one which relates strongly to the standardization issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierce. Um, Camilla, we're gonna turn to you, you've heard now from a few of the governments, um, how they're looking at the issues, what, what they see are the important um, questions and options for working towards uh, global standards and policy uh, approaches. I'd love to hear what your perspective is on this. Sure, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to bring civil society perspective and also a global south perspective on that. It is with these lenses that I intend to contribute to this panel, but obviously with attentive ears on, uh, on the important perspectives of all stakeholders. Well, we have seen that we have a two-sided future with the metaverse. In one side, we have an opportunity, but in the other side, we have some challenges, both related to the real world and also to the virtual world. Therefore, it is essential to think about this value-based future of the metaverse. And for that, I would highlight that we need a cooperation both from a global and regional perspective and also from different stakeholders' perspectives. So it is indeed a pleasure to develop this discussion with you all. Since we are already exploring the potentialities of the metaverse, I would focus on some issues that we have to take into account when we are seeking a value-based metaverse. That means uh, some issues that we have uh, to be aware when reducing the boundaries in this convergence between the real world and the, the virtual world with the concern of not increasing some already existing issues and bringing other issues. I could talk about several issues related to mental health, ethics, data protection, cybersecurity, product safety, also because I work in a consumer organization, but I would like to take this opportunity to, to focus on one main issue that we have to consider while building this uh, sharing standards for a value-based metaverse, which is inclusion. We were talking about human-centric te technologies, how we should put people in the center, and we can't use these technologies to perpetuate exclusion of people. And for that, I would highlight uh, three main topics. Economic power, non-discrimination, and prevenience. First one, economic power. We should gather forces, not exclude potentialities. It is therefore important to develop open standards, interoperability, so we can provide more alternatives uh, for even more innovation in this space, and innovation also for consumers in the end. 
non-discrimination in terms of uh, understanding the necessities and the specificities of some vulnerable populations in terms of race and ethnicity, age, focusing on children, for example, which, as we have seen, uh, Kyoto, uh, the government of Kyoto, pays a, a strict attention on that in terms of access, uh, accessibility online, so we cannot perpetuate discrimination and exclusion of vulnerable people. Inclusion in terms of provenance. And this is tricky, because we are talking about how to build, how to build go, uh, global standards on these issues, but we also have to consider some regional contexts and some regional and cultural specificities. For example, I can talk about my region and my country. We face big challenges related to internet access. And notwithstanding the great potentialities of the metaverse for uh, a great part of the population, they don't even have meaningful connectivity, uh, at least. So we have also to take a step back and think, how can we connect more people so they can enjoy the potentialities, not only of the internet, but also the potentialities of this new technology? Disinformation, we have mentioned that also, but uh, in some countries, disinformation is harmful uh, for elections, for democracy. So we cannot use these spaces for uh, these purposes. We have to think on how can we tackle that and how can, how can we consider the countries or regional context related to that. We shouldn't have second class users. We have to think on how can we include more people. No one should be, should be left behind. So summing up, we have global challenges and as it was already mentioned, the borders are fluid in the metaverse. And because of that, we need a holistic approach and a joint effort of different jurisdictions and different stakeholders. But we have to think about inclusions in terms of people that are included, not perpetuating discrimination, and considering regional contexts. So we have to set global standards, but considering these uh, this contextual specificities. So how the metaverse, uh, how inclusive is the metaverse and how much is it perpetuating the system of exclusion? And how can we advance for the better? I, until now, I highlighted only the issues, but I hope to talk uh, more in a, in a second phase on the potentialities on how can we solve that and how can we advance on a human, ri human rights-based technology, human rights-based metaverse to enjoy its full potential. And we have to focus on what matters the most. Consumers, citizens, data subjects, internet users, in the end, people should be in the center. Thank you so much, Camilla. I'm going to turn it now to our online speaker, uh, Neil. Good morning. Thank you for getting up early for us. Uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about the Metaverse Standards Association the impetus uh, you had for creating this, and what contribution you're expecting to make uh, to this journey we're, we're pursuing in values-based development of the metaverse. Sure, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. It's an honor to be here, and I hope to be uh, there in person uh, next time. Um, so, uh, yes, there's a lot of ongoing debate around the nature of the metaverse, as we've already heard, and I think at its core, uh, something we can all uh, rely on it. it's a combination of multiple disruptive technologies. There's AI, there's GPU processing for graphics and compute, there's XR, there's Web3, there's advanced networking, including 5G uh, plus and beyond. Um, so it's also appropriate, of course, that the metaverse is being discussed here at IGF because the metaverse is going to be the spatial evolution of the web, combining the connectivity of the web with the immersiveness of spatial computing. So given that background, the genesis of the Metaverse Standards Forum was the realization that the industry is attempting to build an open platform uh, with an unprecedented level of interoperability. And that's going to take a constellation of open standards uh, from dozens, maybe even hundreds of standards organizations and as standards organizations often like to work by themselves, we urgently needed a neutral venue uh, for cooperation and coordination between standards organizations and the wider industry. And uh, the forum launched, we're very young, 
uh, the forum launched in just June 2022. Um, and the key thing, it's not another standards organization. It doesn't create standards itself. Uh, the forum uh, seems to be unique in existing to ex as assist existing standards organizations create effective standards that we need for the metaverse uh, through a close connection to industry and gathering real world use cases and, and requirements. And there has been significant interest. Um, uh, now the forum has over 2,500 uh, member organizations, uh, which I think is uh, an indication of the ongoing interest in the metaverse uh, as a topic. The forum takes a very pragmatic approach and it's not trying to dictate what the metaverse is going to be. Uh, we think that will evolve naturally over time, but we continually poll the forum members on what are the domains that are most urgently in need of cooperation for standardization. We have created working groups in those domains that work on interoperability projects uh, to create a short-term stream of business opportunities while a larger vision of the metaverse unfolds. We like to say we're not trying to create the metaverse cathedral, but we are trying to bake the bricks that we're going to need to build the road to the metaverse. Um, the forum membership has voted to create working groups for many technical domains, including 3D assets, avatars, XR, uh, 3D in the web stack, 5G, 6G networking, digital twins, and more. And many have been mentioned here already in the session. Um, but interestingly, though, the domain group that got most votes from the forum membership by quite a large margin was not for pure technical interoperability, but was for privacy, cybersecurity, and inclusiveness. And so that working group is going to take close cooperation on both technical and legislative initiatives. And the working group has already attracted many experts in the domain. And interestingly, the group is working to establish social norms and other means to ensure an open, equitable and human centric foundation uh, for the metaverse. So the forum is very active. Uh, we have working group meetings almost daily. And, and so we hope our contribution can be a pragmatic, uh, industry connected and, and proactive input to the development of a value based metaverse. And we're honored and excited to be a part of this discussion today at IGF. And we hope to be you know, a, a constructive contributor to this uh, global discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, speaking of industry, we, um, we have the opportunity to hear from uh, Chitai. We have, um, we'd like to hear a little bit about um, some of the engagement that you're doing with policy stakeholders in the metaverse. Particularly, we're interested in that um, regional domain we've talked about. Um, from Africa, Middle East, and Turkey that you're working with. Um, and if you could just help us understand how regional and local considerations are being factored in the approaches you're taking. Thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, similar to Camila, I will also try to bring a regional uh, view uh, to the discussion uh, for the Africa, Middle East, and Turkey region uh, that I'm also working for. Uh, but uh, before starting, uh, I would like to uh, recognize, uh, like for us, we recognize that developing and implementing global standards for metaverse is a challenging task uh, because like there are different stakeholders involved. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there are regional challenges that we all need to think about. And uh, for the region that I'm working for, Africa, Middle East, and Turkey, as I mentioned, these challenges range from, uh, similar to Camila's point, connectivity to gender divide and also language barrier. And for some of these challenges, uh, we think AI actually proposed a solution, may propose a solution, for example, language challenge. But for some others, uh, we think we need to keep building uh, stronger uh, partnerships in the region and also initiatives for the readiness for the communities in the region. Uh, I would like to take a one step uh, back uh, before getting into the details of like, what we are seeing in the region and like, what we are doing so far, uh, just to uh, try to explain what are we focusing on when we think about the values and priorities that we have at Meta in designing Metaverse. We are actually focusing on five different areas. Uh, these are uh, economic opportunity, privacy, safety and integrity of our users, uh, and, sorry, four areas, uh, and equity and inclusion. Um, and um, 
as I mentioned, like to ensure our communities in the region uh, will be able to benefit from this technology, we already started our engagements with uh, our stakeholders, uh, both from uh, civil society and also, of course, uh, government stakeholders. In these active engagements, uh, we uh, do listen to them and carry their recommendations to our teams, but also we initiated various efforts that focus on increasing local readiness. Uh, for us, the key term for our region is access, but it's not just uh, connectivity, it's not just af having affordable devices or uh, having an internet that is fast enough, enough uh, to reach this technology, but it goes beyond that and access is also about uh, digital literacy, uh, trust and safety of our users. Uh, for the connectivity part, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, Meta has several investments, uh, infrastructure initiatives, uh, including Two Africa project, uh, which is the largest and longest submarine cable system that will connect more than 33 countries across Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, and, but on top of the connectivity efforts, um, we also uh, started uh, some programmatic efforts uh, to make sure that our communities will be ready for the next iteration of the Internet. These efforts do include a range of programs uh, which we trained over uh, 350,000 small medium businesses, 5,300 civil society organizations, and uh, 340,000 young people and educators in our region only, Africa, Middle East and Turkey region, on digital literacy uh, and also to increase their digital capacity and prepare them for developing digital experiences and careers. Uh, some of the examples that I may provide from these uh, readiness uh, projects that we have are uh, we started uh, a first, uh, our first regional metaverse academy in Saudi Arabia uh, where we conducted discovery workshops uh, and we brought together more than 3,000 people and there was a significant representation of female attendees in these uh, workshops. Uh, we also launched a skill up training in Saudi Arabia as well, where uh, we trained uh, 81 participants. More than half of them were women in this, pro in, in this program. And first 50 graduates of this program already uh, created uh, a project which uh, is showcasing Saudi pop-up artists and cultural heritage in a metaverse museum. Uh, we also uh, conducted a similar program in uh, our Pan-Africa Metaverse Summit, uh, where we also launched Africa XR Marathon, Metaton, yeah, we call it, um, which was designed to support African uh, XR talent. Um, we do know that like, there is still much that we can do and we will be doing as the business uh, part of this uh, technological development that we are all trying to contribute. And we also think that like, it is very important for all of us to have this conversation uh, today uh, so uh, everyone can benefit from this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So we've come full circle. Uh, I would like to ask you a question, uh, Vice Governor. Um, as you're pursuing the value-based ecosystem of the Kyoto City, we've seen some of your initiatives. Um, we'd like to understand better what your guidance would be for global policymakers and stakeholders that are considering such standards and aligned approaches and how those might assist you with your needs. えっと、まずあの、私はまだあの課長ぐらいやったと思うんですけど、その時にですね、インターネットを使ってボランティアの人がインターネットを使ってコップ 
同じように議論をインターネットで世界に提供することをやりました私どもが今回ステートメントを作ったのはまあまあまあベータ版みたいなもので先ほどもご指摘があったようにまだ要素として欠けている部分があるのは当然だというふうに思うんですけれどもこれを広く市民社会に我々はこんな社会を目指してメタに取り組んでいくんだということを発信することで市民の方々がどのようなことを考えられたりどのような課題意識を持たれたりというようなことを我々にフィードバックをしていただくというような作業を非常にこう市民レベルあるいはコミュニティのレベルで深くやっていくことが非常に大きな活動に広がっていくんではないかというふうにまず思っていますしたがってこういう場に今回呼んでいただいたのは非常に嬉しく思ってるんですけどもこれを例えば何年後かに京都はどんなことになってるのということを発表させていただくまあこういうことを続けていくことがえー、本当にメタバースの市民化みたいなことを実現する最大のエンジンになる,ではなるんではないかと私は思っております。Thank you for those additional thoughts.、Um, Camila, we're going to come back to you. Um, so, you've heard a little bit about what that、um, impetus is and different perspectives on how that's being pursued. What are the component parts? What are the elements that we should, we should put in our thinking? Perfect. So,、uh, since we're talking about a human rights based technology, since we're talking about that we have to focus on inclusion, we, we should put people in the center. I agree that we need shared norms, we need shared standards, and maybe regulation. So, we need a, a common international understanding of that, but as I already highlighted, considering regional context. About the shared norms, I would highlight also three main topics openness,、uh, rights and legislation, and context. Openness in terms of gathering the potentialities of different and fragmented metaverse in an interconnected innovation development of the metaverse through interoperability, obviously considering data protection rights, and open access, not to have a fragmented metaverse. Beyond、uh, openness, it is also important to guarantee people's access to rights and also to guarantee the compliance of already existing norms. So sometimes when we are developing innovation, we are thinking about how we can build、uh, new standards, new norms, but we already have some norms that, might, that should be applied to them. For example, data protection legislation, competition legislation, and consumer law. Context. Because, as I already mentioned, although、uh, we have to lead this discussion globally, we have to consider local and, and cultural and, and regional specificities. So, we ought to have a baseline that is sufficiently protective, but also sufficiently broad to, to, to be flexible to consider these contexts. And I have to say that this is a challenge <laughs> on how can, can we develop this. But how can we develop this? The best thing to do is to gather different perspectives as we are already doing right now. We have to have people from different regions, as we have in here. We have to have multi stakeholder、uh, debates, multi stakeholder development of these norms. We have to have engagement of companies, as we can see in this panel, cooperation of governments through qualified international discussions facilitated by key actors as OECD. And governance and participation. As the vice, govern the vice governor mentioned, we have to foment CSO, civil society, and technical sector participation on these discussions. And from, from civil society and the global south, we remain super available to, to contribute to this innovative and inclusive future for a human rights based metaverse. Thank you very much, Camilla. I'm hearing some strong convergence on certain things.、Um, Pierce, can you share a little bit more with us about、um, what's next what, for the Commission and how you're pursuing、um, this approach to align globally? Thank you. 
Well, the, uh, the strategy set out in the policy communication I mentioned, well, it consists of 10 sets of actions. And don't, wor don't worry, I'm not going to <laughs> go through all of them. But it, it does have, um, it's articulated around four pillars, um, which I'll just mention briefly. Uh, no, is that okay? It's better. Well, good. I, I, I won't repeat myself. Our strategy, four pillars. Empowering people and reinforcing their skills uh, required to develop innovative applications. Supporting uh, a Web 4.0 industrial ecosystem to scale up European excellence in research, but also to foster innovation and to prevent fragmentation. Supporting societal progress and virtual public services through two new public flagships in the area of smart cities and health, respectively, which directly impact the quality of life of citizens. And then the fourth one is governance at EU level and at international level to shape global standards for an open and interoperable virtual worlds and to promote Web 4.0 standards in line with our vision and standards. So let, let me just elaborate briefly on that last pillar, uh, which I mentioned earlier as well, linked to the governance element. Um, as I mentioned, we, we need to ensure that virtual worlds are designed as open and interoperable from the outset to ensure true empowerment and diverse participation. And that, of course, in itself is, is a win-win situation because it can foster innovation, collaboration and creativity. And so addressing the governance at EU and global level will be needed to achieve that openness. It won't come naturally. And interoperability of virtual worlds. Um, uh, and it'll be key to the future developments and uses. And also, it'll be key to uptake, we must remember. In addition, we have to have international engagement on topics related to content and practice, which have proven already to be very difficult in some cases in the internet. Um, we have issues such as access and creation against disinformation, censorship versus freedom of speech, surveillance against privacy and so on. These are global um, challenges. From our perspective, there's a, a clear commitment to, to continue to engage with the existing multi-stakeholder internet governance institutions. We don't think we need to create new ones. It is in fact, the, the, this is now a challenge, but also a positive one to us to prove that the existing institutions, of course, including the IGF, has the ability to adapt and grow along with the technology, and we believe that it can do so. But that's part of the discussions that will dominate all of this week. Um, uh, and, and also, in the same vein, to develop human rights-based virtual worlds, we should rely on recognized instruments. It's not because the technology is new that somehow we have to build something new around it. Uh, that's, that's, that's an important lesson. We already have the Declaration for the Future of the Internet with uh, nearly 70 signatories, including, as we saw clearly this morning, the Global South. And that sets out a future for the Internet that's open, free, global, interoperable, reliable and secure, and that builds on multi-stakeholder governance. So in the same way we in Europe can add to that with our European Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles, but it's clearly that the views or the principles are were, uh, shared widely, uh, and widely more to the point. Um, there has been a UN resolution in 2019 which affirmed that the same rights that people have offline must also be protected online. Um, and of course, the governance for openness and interoperability can only be accompanied um, and, and implemented by the global multi-stakeholder community. A state-led approach will not work. Of course, we have to rely on the technicians as well as civil society, IETF, ICANN, and the IGF, as well as the national and regional initiatives for that uh, multi-stakeholder input, including, because I've, I've heard it so strongly from Camilla, the ability to adapt and take account of local and regional uh, differences, uh, cultural and otherwise. So, um, as part of our contribution to this work, we are launching an expert group uh, within the European Union to bring our member states together with experts uh, who share a common approach, but also then how does that translate practically into the design of virtual worlds and Web 4.0.
We'll also support the creation of a, of a technical multi-stakeholder governance process to address essential aspects of virtual worlds. And now when I say that, uh, I, I want to clearly clarify that, of course, it's not to create new structures, but to ensure that with the communities, the stakeholders, the groups, civil society, technical and otherwise, who we already bring together, that we will have a process within those fora uh, that it goes beyond the existing institutions, but only insofar as whether it's for standards or in terms of, for example, recruiting a new technical community in relation to new technologies that we would then feel that need to, 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 to innovate. Uh, and it would look at issues such as interoperability, rights management, uh, and of course the transactions in the virtual world and identity management, where we already have quite a lot going on in the European Union. So that is how we see things evolving. We want to do it with our global partners, uh, uh, like-minded member states, but of course the global multi-stakeholder community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierce. Uh, Professor Kozuka, we're going to turn to you um, to get a little bit more perspective on um, how Japan might use what you've done in your study group to inform and also how Japan might look at being informed by um, global standards developments in the metaverse. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, and a, a, the, the first phase of our a study group has a, a was concluded earlier this year, and we are now talking about the second stage. Oh, could, could yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> my, my slide is now shared. And so, and in that, in, during that second phase, and we will consider about the more uh, kind of concretized uh, principles uh, uh, that um, and reflect our approaches to the metaverse. And having he heard the, the interventions today and a, a from the industry a representative to consumer representative, and of course uh, from the government and intergovernmental organizations, and uh, I'm now confident that a, a everyone has more or less the same uh, mind. And a, so number one, the, the metaverse should be based on the democratic value that is a pretty obvious, and also and people's rights and freedom should be uh, protected there, uh, but we also note that that does not mean that kind of un, uh, a unrestrained and a, 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 a freedom a, a without any rules or norms, but rather a, a, it's a, it should be a balanced approach a, a, a with with appropriate and a. a uh, appropriateness and uh, to uh, to prevent harms on a, a, any part participants in the metaverse, and also we need to respect uh, the, the dignity of individuals and the fairness and the diversity. All these things have been uh, voiced already uh, from the, uh, the the participants of today's session. So Japan's approach should, uh, uh, will not be much different from that those and. Uh, 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 and a, a, another thing a, that we a, a, we heard today is the the, the importance of the I international and a, a, a commitment, and so and a, 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 we also think that and a, a having dialogues within my country a, will be a, we co a, a make up our contribution to the global forum, and we can then and exchange our. V views and inputs, including, of course, uh, this very early attempts of the, this a, a province of Kyoto, and uh, already they have 10 principles, which is very I I important, and we can learn from, uh, a lot from the, that, and so those will also be examined and brought into the global forum. And a, 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 these a values are very abstract, and no one will a, 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 a dispute those, uh, the importance of those, uh, but we we need to have more kind of concrete and a, a, a strategy to build up a, 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 a rights-based, a value-based a, a metaverse. So and a, a, there should be more uh, kind, kind of a more concretized and a principles for to make the metaverse trustworthy. A, for example, accountability, transparency, and interoperability, all those things. 
uh, we are going to discuss and cl uh, uh, carefully uh, in, during the second phase of our uh, task force. And then, of course, we are happy to uh, bring them to the global world and uh, have dialogues with various stakeholders and, uh, 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 from various regions and various parts of the world and, uh, so that we can have a better approach to the metaverse. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Chetai, we're going to go to you now. Uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about how you're working to, to align with the stakeholders um, and what, uh, um, what factors might impede that alignment. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to express that like, we continuously explore avenues to incorporate human rights into our services and products and practices. Uh, this also includes uh, interoperability uh, for metaverse and also uh, ensuring AI serves communities fairly. Um, and uh, in our um, engagements with stakeholders, um, to make sure uh, that like we can uh, keep these promises. Uh, we actually act uh, from certain um, principles that we have, which are grounded in our commitments uh, to our corporate human rights policy and those United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, and as part of this, we actually started uh, conducting a human rights due diligence effort on uh, metaverse and potential human rights implications of that, which we are looking forward to share with the communities uh, when it's ready to share. Uh, and we also follow uh, what, what is happening in the ecosystem, and we are trying to be part of it as much as we can. Uh, in relation to this, we, we support the principles set in the Declaration for the future, future of the Internet, the Copenhagen Pledge on Tech and Democracy. Uh, we support and trying to contribute to ongoing UN processes, the OECD and other relevant multilateral and multi-stakeholder fora, including here IGF and Freedom Online Coalition. Uh, we also uh, joined the XR Advisory Council alongside policymakers, experts, and academics to be able to advise and address key issues facing XR ecosystem. Uh, also, we are uh, one of the founding members of the XR Association, uh, which is helping to build responsible XR. Um, we are, in addition to these, like being part of these avenues, we are directly partnering with universities around the world to analyze everything from economic opportunity to ethics uh, and responsible design uh, in the metaverse. Uh, we have a two-year, uh, 50 million uh, US dollar global XR uh, programs and research fund to support this uh, critical external research and programs, uh, which will support students, creators, and small businesses uh, and owners of uh, this technology. Um, uh, we are hoping with uh, being by being involved into this um, debate in the most possible extent, uh, we will be able to consider everyone and by uh, understanding better uh, uh, how everyone may benefit uh, from uh, metaverse, uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, deliver uh, an experience that different people uh, may enjoy. Uh, we uh, in these um, avenues that we are trying to be part of, uh, we always want to underline this is not something that we can achieve uh, by ourselves and this requires a collaborative effort. Uh, Metaverse won't be a thing uh, that is built by one company. Uh, there are like many uh, players uh, also in the business side uh, and uh, we won't be the ones setting the rules for how it works but obviously we are in a position where we can uh, contribute greatly uh, and um, uh, we uh, like no need to repeat but like we uh, support the uh, seamless interconnectedness of these virtual spaces uh, which will require new standards norms uh, te technical specifications uh, and uh, of course these can only be agreed collaboratively uh, through bodies like a metaverse standards forum uh, or uh, through uh, forums like uh, this one Thank you very much um, for uh, that perspective. We're going to move online now, back to you, Neil. 
Um, we'd like to get a sense, as you're working across industry on this question, you mentioned um, the size of your membership and working on a broader um, uh, hor like horizontal effort. Um, from that perspective, can you give us an idea of what important actions governments uh, can take to support these efforts and alignment? Yes, absolutely. Now, this has been a really uh, interesting discussion, so thank you, uh, everyone. Um, I think that there are three points I'd like to make. For, firstly, uh, we have seen in the Metaverse Standards Forum that, that many in, in industry, of course, are very infused by the potential benefits of uh, this thing we're calling uh, the Metaverse, but importantly, they are also very aware of the increased dangers of these powerful technologies that we're bringing together uh, to issues such as privacy and security, uh, perhaps sensitized by some of the issues you know, created by today's social media landscape, for example. Um, and I think we've seen, therefore, that industry is paying close attention to the importance of creating a safe and inclusive metaverse. Uh, after all, no one's interests are served at all if the metaverse is not a platform that users both enjoy and can trust. So I, I think this creates the, op the openness in industry to the idea um, that the relationship between industry and, and government can and should be cooperative as only legislation and technology working together is going to create uh, and complete this metaverse puzzle. Um, the relationship does not have to be combative. You know, ideally, legislation can create a necessary safe space where technical innovation uh, can fr thrive within you know, agreed uh, gu guide rails. Um, and of course, therefore, you know, a positive way to foster collaboration between industry and legislators is early cooperation and dialogue on the technology the risks and opportunities uh, to build that mutual understanding. Uh, if the forum can help uh, foster that kind of constructive discussion, uh, working with the other initiatives that are represented here, that's something we'd very much welcome, of course. And lastly, in my own personal journey through the forum, interoperability uh, is often a term that has been you know, is used in the context of technical standards, technical interoperability. Um, but um, through the discussions in a forum, I've come to understand that you know, interoperability is not just important in technical standards. You know, legislative interoperability is important as well because the metaverse is going to be deployed globally. Uh, we hopefully can strive for as much consistency as possible across different legislative domains, while of course uh, being sensitive to uh, regional needs as have been discussed here. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, so, Audrey, we're going to give you the last word on this panel. Um, you've heard the different streams of work in the different uh, perspectives on this panel, and we were wanting to look a little bit more at what OECD current priority actions um, might contri contribute to the pursuit, and, and also we've heard about in different institutions and not a need for additional institutions. So how can IOs help? from that perspective? Um, so it, it strikes me that um, at, at a fairly basic level, we need some terminology cleanup and some definitional attention, um, which is something that we actually spend a lot of time doing at the OECD. It tends to be the least glamorous part of our work. Um, not that it's very glamorous, but uh, but I, I do think just, just listening to all the interventions, even our own, you know, the, the way that we describe this technology, I think we've got to get a little bit more grounded in, in what we mean um, and uh, um, what we're talking about because without that, it's difficult to see where there are gaps and I think we don't, uh, there's lots of consensus about not creating new things that are duplicative of old things because that's an easy thing to agree to. It's easy to agree not to duplicate. It's hard to understand if you're duplicating or not and so I think without... Um, some some policy definitions and which which can of course be based on technical definitions but generally in the policy space we need policy understandable definitions as well it seems like there's there's some really important foundational work to be done there and um, that that can be an important input to policy coherence or interoperability is 
um, as Neil just just said, I think we obviously very much believe in sort of policy interoperability or cohesiveness, but usually that requires some foundational uh, definitional coherence as well. And I, it, it strikes me that we might be lacking that a bit in, in on this topic, I think. Uh, so I, that that's one area of work. And then I think the other thing to say is that I, I I do think that a, a deeper dive, whether it's a taxonomy or a benchmarking or a stock taking of something of, of what um, what the differences are, because you know just the proliferation of guidance or principles or interpretation of values relative to a new technology, is um, sounds nice, but I think it, it's only really useful if we know what's different and what's unique here. And I think that gets a little bit back to the definition, and then it gets to you know, sort of understanding some of maybe the risk areas that are unique and the opportunity areas that are unique and um, what we already have that applies. Uh, I think there's lots of examples of things and guidance that we have that certainly apply in, in the metaverse and then or in the immersive world and the question of what gaps we have, you know, and if I just looked at some of the principles from Kyoto, I would say maybe some of those could be thought about a little, but at least from from where we sit, there there are things we we haven't we haven't really thought about at least in that in that way. So um, I think some mapping of of how existing things apply to see where there are some gaps and what might be needed. Um, but certainly, uh, just again, uh, the, the 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 starting point for any kind of international cooperation and coherence is going to be definitions. And um, I heard a, I heard a lot of different terms, and we even you know at the OECD use a lot of different terms. So uh, it, that that really stood out to me, and perhaps an area where we can um, we can help uh, move the collective understanding in the policy space forward, building on what other technical organizations and technical standardization organizations are um, are already uh, doing. Thanks. All right, so now the speakers are unknown to us. They're amongst you all who would like to take the floor, either to ask a question or contribute um, something. You've got a microphone in front of you. I'll maybe ask you, I see two of you at this table and two here. Great, we'll, st we'll go around like that, please. Well, first of all, thank you for all the panelists here and online. It was really interesting discussion. Um, and I think I would like to... Could I just ask you to introduce yourself? I'm oh, sorry, I'm, to introduce I'm really yourself sorry, I didn't, so I didn't community do it. knows who's Yes, speaking. my name is Paola Galvez. I'm Peruvian. I'm a tech policy advisor. Um, now a uh, candidate of Master of Public Policy at Oxford, but I am a former advisor at the Peruvian government. Um, and actually, I wanted to touch a point that I think we discussed, but very, very lightly, which is capacity building of policymakers and people in government. Um, we are navigating a decade of digital, actually the digital era. And I would like to hear from the panelists, um, any of you would, uh, would like to contribute, how in the organizations are working towards this. Uh, we've read different documents recently, the guidelines or uh, on generative AI that was published by the OECD. Um, it's hard, for instance, to identify which content has been developed by AI or by humans. Um, it's, it is hard to tackle this information in that sense as well. Uh, but if policymakers that are developing these rules do not have the appropriate skills or really do not uh, how to navigate this, how can we reach this consensus, this uh, cooperation that we're looking for. Um, I, would like, I would love to hear from, um, from Mr. Pierce, if it's possible, uh, to, to hear the European uh, perspective. Uh, as a Latin American, uh, our countries are usually looking at what is happening in Europe um, because we usually tend to grab human-centered positions as, as the European um, does. Um, so that will be my question. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a few questions and then we'll come back to our panel for, um, for that. I see there's one here and then I'm going to come over here.
Hello there. Uh, my name's Eric Hawkinson. I'm actually a local here in Kyoto, um, immersive learning specialist dealing in augmented virtual reality in educational contexts. Kyoto ni sunderu no kakucho genjutsu, kaso genjutsu no kenkyu suru no daigo kyoshi yoroshiku Um I'd like to try to frame, this is all great foundational work and conversations we're under here, but uh, I feel like a lot of the times working this technology the last 10, 20 years, a lot of the incentive structures are somehow kind of stacked against a lot of the things that we've talked about here today, right? So inclusivity, interoperability, and things like that. I would like to try to get the panel to kind of frame the conversation in how likely all of these things are to be successful, and success being kind of comparing it to the wave of social media or other technologies that have come in the past, and also where the low-hanging fruit is. Where are we likely to get or see the most opportunities for success on, around these things? And where exactly do we need to focus most of our efforts to get most of these things to come to actualization? Thanks. OK, so I do see that we have another question on this side. Um, we'll go here, and then we'll come over here if you, if you bear with me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Karanikolas. I'm the executive director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. I wanted to pick up where I think Ms. Plonk left off um, and, and wondered if any of the other panelists wanted to drill down more deeply into the specific content or privacy challenges that you might have identified, which are either novel to um, extended reality uh, or exacerbated by these new technologies. And I ask because my research center is going to be starting a project in January on exactly that. So uh, if you're working on that, if you've already figured that out, you'll save me some time, but wanted to figure out where the state of research is. All right, over to you. Yes, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor from the University of Aarhus, and I'm a member of CSAC. Uh, I have a very sh short question to Neil about standards. You know, how the uh, Metaverse Standardization Forum is collaborating with the uh, existing traditional internet standardization bodies, like the IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium, and ITUT. Thank you. All right. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'll give our, our panelists an opportunity to respond. Sir? Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Park. I'm the head of uh, public policy for Roblox for the APAC region. Um, it was very great hearing about the work that the Japanese government has done for the metaverse guidelines. Uh, and particularly on page two of your slide, Professor Koska, you're talking about the need to balance between freedom and rules. Um, I think that's a very important point that was mentioned by other panelists as well, particularly considering that there isn't necessarily a consensus on even democratic values. Um, freedom of speech is important to all democracies, but some countries enforce it differently than other countries, balance it with things like um, uh, personal uh, reputation or, or other issues such as uh, election laws, for example. So we would love to hear if what the Japanese government has in mind to bring that consensus. Perhaps you would consider something like data free flow of trust for the uh, DFFT-like initiative for the uh, metaverse. So we would love to hear that. Thank you. All right. Um, so, who would like to come back on the question of how IOs are working on capacity building? I th sure, uh, I think maybe Audrey and Pierce, because I think it would yeah, be Yeah, let me, I, I, I'm gonna, if I can merge an answer to a couple of the questions, and then happy to pass on. Um, so, yes. Um, so in our research, we see that um, basically 80% of the headsets, if we're just in the virtual reality space, again, I'm back to my definitional issues, but in, in VR, VR headsets today are sold by, about 80% of them are sold, 80, 90% by social media companies, basically. So if you're looking at what is the trajectory of that 
piece of the technology, which again, I'm not trying to extrapolate it out to all immersive technology because there's a bunch of different categories and we have done our own research and have own, our own papers coming forward, but just to say that, you know, if you just look at who's building the things and who's buying them, you know, it does sort of lead you down the path of this is a game or this is the path of, you know, it's a it's an environment in which we're extending social media and gaming and and to some degree, it's not surprising because a lot of the investment that came into this came from the gaming industry and, and, and VR. So I think that the, the data that we have now is that, you know, that that's where that's where it sits. And, you know, there's huge market concentration. We know that um, with, you know, 10% uh, of the, the, the VR headsets are sold by a bunch of different little players. And then, you know, the vast majority is sold by by three, one very big one, Meta, which is not um, surprising to anyone here. So um, that's pretty clear in terms of the market uh, dynamics. And so uh, whether the question of whether we expect to see it taken up in a broader, more democratic, you know, I don't know. I think the question is maybe more of what are the conditions that would make that possible in, in sectors in which it's viable? Like where should the technology be used for what purposes and how do you get it there beyond this social media use, which is clearly where, where we're sitting today based on what we have. So that's the short um, answer that I can offer, which is probably all things you already know given where you're sitting, but it would be interesting to hear your reaction. To colleague from the United States um, over there. Uh, so in, in the privacy space, I mean, we're doing some work on this as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting data about just how much um, new types of uh, personal data are collected in these virtual environments, particularly around body movements, around eye movements, around, uh, and it's just so much more and so much more frequently than what we're used to thinking about in, in, in classic data protection. Um, and there's, uh, you know, we have, you know, some information, you know, some, at least it's a couple years old now, so, but, you know, 20 minutes in a virtual reality simulation leaves just under 2 million unique recordings of body language in 20 minutes. So it's it's a fantastic scale that we're not used to coping with, I think, probably from a privacy protecting perspective or even from a, a legal perspective and certainly from a policy perspective before. So there's also, you know, nonverbal communication. I've moved all kinds of, you know, psychological and, 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 and types of data that, you know, don't necessarily come through in, in, in the classic ways that we've used technology. So I think that's a big category which people are paying attention to in the privacy space. And we are certainly paying attention to now. We have some research coming out next year based, uh, you know, looking that looks in, in broadly, just focusing on virtual reality that look broadly into pros and cons and in the privacy space, some of the details out, some of that I won't take the time to deeply go into it here, but I suspect for the privacy community, um, I imagine you're all thinking about that because there's some pretty good academic research around it um, that we've looked at and started to sort of dive a little bit into the questions of what does that mean relative to sort of data minimization or <laughs> data limitation, uh, sort of classic principles of privacy and data protection um, that, um, that this may very well challenge. And um, so I think, how can I always help? I mean, I, I think we, we do, a f at least the OECD, we do a few things. We do research, we do, we put, we try to make complicated things more accessible and understandable to policymakers. We do our own um, data gathering and empirical work. We also make recommendations in policy space. So I think, you know, when there's an area where something connects to where we have competency, we can help sort of bring those things together and bring a policy community to the table to understand and, and, and talk about it in a sort of like-minded way because our membership at its base is, is, is democratic, uh, you know, market economies that tend to at least think about democratic values in a, in a similar way. Um, but obviously this technology uh, affects affects a broad, the broad world, and so we also, that's why we have the Global Forum, so we can also work with, with broader, uh, a broader stakeholder set, which brings me back maybe to, to the last uh, question around, you know, yeah, values are values, but they're not always shared, and I think, you know, there's, there's an important distinction between where you can get maybe agreement on a common approach to something or where you can um, work together to share information and, 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 and still, even if you don't have a common approach or even if you take different approaches, um, to still find ways um, 
to work together and, and maybe learn from each other. It's a complicated environment that we live in today to, to do that. Um, and it's, it's true that, uh, you know, values are, uh, are, um, can vary across cultures and societies. And so that's, I think, why, at least in the OECD context, we tried to focus on things that are shared, where, people, where, where countries have an, a common approach. Um, but I think there's, there's other or work beyond, you know, sort of making recommendations and having hard agreements where, uh, you know, a broader community can participate. Thanks, Audrey. Um, so I'm going to ask Pierce uh, to come in on the, the question that you want. I'm also going to jump to Japan and Neil. We've got a few minutes left, so if you can um, be quick, thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, I couldn't possibly answer all of the questions, um, and, 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 but in, in relation to what I could add value and, and where we were particularly addressed, on capacity building, uh, I could give a very short answer is that we're nowhere in terms of specifically capacity building in relation to virtual worlds or the metaverse, but I think that's what you see in our communication. We're, we're trying to establish that capacity building and understanding. One point that I referred to, which I think is particularly important, do the communities, including particularly, for example, the technical community, maybe the, 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 the private sector, but also civil society, do we have everybody in the room uh, there may be more that we need to bring in specifically for, for, for virtual worlds, uh, and we are learning. On the standardization, it's the same thing. Do we understand the technology? Are we working with the people who may understand the technology in order to actually have something effective on um, standards? But all of it will, as I have said, I hope made it clear, will be against, measured against the, the human-centric approach, human values, human rights. And then very quickly, and I'll try and be telegraphic to, to Michael from UCLA, uh, in our work, but this is not definitive, we have identified issues, particularly as, as uh, Audrey was saying with regard to the privacy space, but the functioning of avatars, for example, with regard to privacy. Um, uh, the safety of data. We ha have an issue with regard to virtual assets. We're still trying to keep up with cryptocurrencies, etc., and virtual assets will make that much more complex. And then finally, it's actually the health aspects, and it's the health aspects of the wearer, particularly of the equipment, and that health uh, discussion has to include psychological well-being. So uh, if, like me, you had teenage children 20 years ago, there was a problem of how many hours did they spend video gaming. If you translate that problem to the virtual worlds, it, it could be that the psychological socialization uh, problems could be you know, magnified enormously. So, so those are three issues. Not, that's not a definitive list, and of course we don't have the definitive answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And thank you very much, and thank you for your question. Um, well, and a, a, a freedom of speech is, of course, the ba very basis of the democratic society. That is quite obvious, and no one doubts that. And on the other hand, and a, a, if the metaverse is a, a becomes full of a, a disinformation and defamation and consumer fraud, a, a, it is also obvious that no one will, uh, wants that to take place. So in that, a, in that sense, and a, a, we, a, it is quite quite clear that we need to have some norms, social norms acceptable to the society. The important thing is that uh, we, we shouldn't uh, 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 t uh, try to find out the uh, uh, answer or the correct uh, balance uh, on the issue. Uh, if we close the discussions on uh, 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 how to uh, hit the balance of, of the, 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 the norm and the, the freedom, then that is not democracy. Uh, uh, we understand that democracy is, after all, the continuation of the dialogues among the citizens, and that is a very important thing. And uh, that, that's what about capacity building. You need to come to Kyoto, Kyoto province, and work with the local government and uh, the local expert. <laughs> and uh, uh, to be more serious, and a uh, 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 a, a, a expertise uh, a, a needs to be built wi within the di dialogues with the industry and within the dialogues with the users. It should not be an, a, a only with the, the, the policy at the high level. That is, uh, that is what I thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we're using up a bit of a five-minute grace period here. Thank you for your indulgence. But since we got questions, it's really great that we can just uh, come back on them. Neil, I'm going to uh, call on you for the question about how you're collaborating with other technical organizations. Yes, um, I'll make it quick. So thank you for the question. It's a great question. So broadly, the standards landscape, I think you can divide it into two classes of uh, standardization organizations. There's the 
industry consortia like uh, W3C, Open Geospatial Consortium, Kronos Group, and many others. Um, it's uh, the forum, I think, has a clear relationship to those that many are already members, and we're already busy gathering coordinating requirements, uh, helping to you know, uh, help in that process and generating visibility for those uh, organizations work relevant to the metaverse. Of course, there are many larger organizations that you mentioned that are working on initiatives too. They're very valuable, IGF, ITU, IETF, ISO, IEEE. There are a lot of initiatives and you no, know, it, it can be confusing <laughs> uh, how many there are and uh, there are overlaps. And so to be honest, we are still figuring out how the forum can best add value, if we can add value and how we can add value to complement those larger uh, organizations and initiatives. We have had uh, though uh, positive collaborative discussions already with ITU, ISO and IEEE, who are looking how to leverage a kind of a neutral industry connected agile organization that is deliberately very different you know, to those much larger and well-established uh, organizations. We, we, we're not trying to compete with anyone. We, we're just here trying to help where we can and we would welcome that discussion on, you know, if we can be uh, helpful. Um, now please, uh, we'd love to talk. Wonderful. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating today. We really appreciated the di discussion. Thank you to our esteemed panelists and informed panelists for contributing uh, and to the um, co-organizers of Japan. I'm going to uh, spare you a summary and I hope that you have all integrated what we've learned since we're running over time. Um, but many thanks, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at other uh, global forum uh, occasions and the rest of the week at the IGF. Take care.